Hello, everyone. Welcome to Southeastern 14. I am Blaine Gilmer, and we are here once again to talk SEC football. As we do here, it is daily coverage of the Southeastern Conference, the best conference in all of sports. I don't care if it's now basketball, the SEC owns it. You got you got football, of course, and then baseball with LSU winning the national championship. You want SEC coverage, you come right here, like, subscribe, turn on notifications, and you also get great content like we're going to have today with our guest of Crane and Company on the Daily Wire, none other than Jake Crane is here with us once again. Jake, thank you for joining us. This is episode three now, man. We're rocking and rolling. Rocking and rolling, man. You know how it is. We, we wait for the season to get here, then all of a sudden it just absolutely flies by. But great slate of games, full slate of games this weekend. Got the corn nuggets, the rest of the appetizers last weekend. Now we get the entree, baby, the steak, the mashed potatoes. I don't know how you get down outside of that. Me, I'm a cream corn guy. Maybe yeah. reach for the asparagus if I'm feeling dangerous, but I could not be more excited uh, about what we have coming up. Yeah, man, and it's all it's all about what you're cooking on there too. We got we'll, we'll get into a whole other. We'll, we might do a Jake's takes on grilling. You know, we may get oh, that let's going. Do it. On. Yeah, we'll, for we'll sure. I'll Bobby flay this whole thing. We'll do our best best pregame recipes or something. But mm -hmm. uh, right now we're going to hop into. You know, we're almost there to the game, so we're going to have game action to actually react to a week from now but as we're going into it one thing that i wanted to touch on is there are position groups out there that are just game changers for a team like they have such a level of talent inside of one position room that it totally changes a game it comes to mind like georgia's tight end group last year with darnell washington and brock bowers that kind of stuff totally changed everything for the opposing team on how you defended them, your run fits, everything. I wanted to get your opinion on this year in the SEC. Do you see one position group that's the best in the league across, across the board? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to stick with Georgia on the offensive line. Uh, I mean, you look what not only they return, but the way they've recruited. And, and it's not just about the starting five. I mean, we can talk about Amarius. We can talk about all those guys, Van Pran, all those guys up front. Uh, but it's the depth that they've accumulated. Because, you know, it's a battle of attrition, especially if you're in the SEC. College football and football in general is a battle of attrition. But if they have a couple guys go down, God forbid, well, they just put some more of the Avengers in there on the offensive line. And that's how you win. And if you're one of these teams that's trying to catch up to a Georgia or an Alabama or, or you know, with what we see LSU doing, bridging yeah. the gap is up front. The offensive line is obviously half of that battle. And Georgia, not only are they good in the zone scheme in the run game, they're agile enough to be able to move lateral, get off combos. But when it comes to the power running game, counter, power, gap scheme runs, trucks, things like that, they're big enough to base block you. And then in pass pro, I mean, running around these guys is like trying to get around Jupiter. It's going to take you forever. And if they get their hands on you, you might as well go ahead and just mail it in. And you can't run down the middle of them. You're not going to bull rush them. So if you're a quarterback, if you're a running back, if you're anybody at a skill position, which to me, offensive line is a skill position. You can call it whatever the hell you want. It's a skill position to me. Uh, you feel unbelievably comfortable. If you're Carson Beck stepping in there, seeing those monsters in front of you, you know, you, you almost, I'm sure probably at some point, he almost feels bad for the defenses they're going to have to go up against when he looks those guys in the eyes when they go out there and get ready to start a drive. Not a lot of people huddle up anymore, but I would have to go Georgia's offensive line. It's one reason why I've gotten them going undefeated in the regular season this year. Yeah, you just look at that position group, and whether it's Xavier Truss, who's been there forever, or whether it's mm -hmm. Cedric Von Braun, who may go down, uh, him, Ben Jones, David Andrews, right there, that conversation may be the greatest centers to ever play there for the University of Georgia. And, and when you talk about Ben Jones and David Andrews, they're two guys that have done it in the league for a long time. So having Cedric Von Braun there back is huge. Tate Ratledge, we know how big that was for Georgia last year, getting him back mm -hmm. from injury. And Amarius Mims, he's a freak. Uh, like you mentioned, you talked about the Avengers. I mean, he's a guy who he's six foot seven, three hundred and forty, and looks like he doesn't have an ounce of fat on him. So, like, that's the kind of build we're talking about. And as you mentioned, with the depth, they've got four and five stars just waiting to yeah. get in and, and and play some ball. So, in terms of that, Kirby Smart did say something in the press conference this past week. He said, "Hey." You know, somebody asked him, how big of a benefit is that to have an experienced center in front of Carson Beck? And and Kirby tried to play up his quarterback a little bit and downplay it. He's like, listen, I don't view Carson 
as an inexperienced quarterback because he's been here for four years. But, Jake, when the bullets are flying, it's got to be com- comforting for him to have Von Prawn there who can, who's seen every blitz, who's seen every front, who has to know to – listen, Carson may be the guy, but – and he may be really good and been there a long time, but it's different when you have to actually be that guy in the moment and having an experienced center has got to help, right? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, you, you talk about confidence and a guy that understands what he's looking at. He can help you with the checks, you know, change in protections. If you get a look that maybe you're not comfortable with, he can help put you in the right spot. And, and he's a guy on the sideline, too, in between drives that, you know, can help vocalize what you're trying to vocalize and keep that group together when it's going good, obviously, and then when it's going bad, which it really doesn't go bad a lot for Georgia. But when it does, you still need that, that kind of calming presence. And I, I tell you what, you know, it, it's one thing, and, and Carson's been there a long time, and Carson's gotten some scratch, you know, but it's one thing to be a guy that goes in there in garbage time, that's gotten some reps during the game, to, to be in there in practice. It's another thing to be the guy the whole offseason that everybody pretty much knows you're the guy. They hit it for a while, but Carson was always going to be the guy. I don't care what anybody says. And then you're the guy taking the mantle from Stetson Bennett, who shout out Stetson on making the uh, Rams 53-man yep. uh, roster as well. My brother's in shambles about it. But, uh, you know, having that that – presence at center uh who again is the leader of the offensive line just like a center fielder is in the outfield and it's going to do nothing but help Carson and help that whole team and I thought the story that Kirby told uh about Cedric in, in, during practice last year getting ready for the national championship game at SEC media day was a really good one but I'll tell you a funny Ben Jones story uh I played at Opelika High School okay and we were playing baseball and we had a pitcher who pitched for Auburn hell of a player named Zach Blatt from Valley Alabama country tough through about 93, 94, had a slider that would just, you know, handcuff you like you just, you know, got busted by the cops. And I'll never forget, we're playing Bibb County in a tournament beginning of the year, and Zach's just shoving it. I mean, just absolutely shoving it down these guys' throat. But they got this four-hole hitter, this big guy, big white guy, um, and he's grunting every time he swings. I'm talking about he swings, <sighs> Like, you know, just you don't do that in baseball. <laughs> and so Zach, after the first inning, is in the dugout like, I'm going to hit that. I'm going to hit him. Like, next time he gets out there, I'm going to drill him 94 right to the back. And think Zach was throwing a perfect game through, like, three innings when he came up against so Zach decided not to do it. Well, fast forward a couple years later, that big white dude from Bibb County was Ben Jones. And I'll never forget, <laughs> Zach looked at me and goes, man, I'm glad I didn't hit that guy. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it ended up being a good business on that mound that. confrontation, huh? Yeah, that uh, he uh, you know, Ben, little little more agile than what he looked like he was up at the plate. A uh, hell of a player, a uh, great leader. You know everything we've heard about him, not only his career at Georgia but in the NFL. So there's a funny Ben Jones story for you. Yeah, he it's unreal what that guy went through. He told he told me on a show he came came on as a guest, told me that he broke his collarbone in a game uh, for the Titans, but he had a consecutive game streak going and it was jabbing up into his neck on the inside and they taped it down with electrical tape and he finished the game. Uh, they guys are down. insane, man. Some of those guys are just insane. Some of the stories you hear about, I mean, just it, it'll blow your mind how tough these guys really are. And and that's not a, that's not a non fit. There's no really such thing outside of kicker and punter as a non holder as a non-physical position, center is not a non-physical. You're out there back blocking with a broken collarbone. That gives me the heebie-jeebies, man. Yeah. So, And I did want to throw an honorable mention out there and tell me what you think about this. I wanted to throw an honorable mention in terms of best group uh, out there to uh, LSU's wide receiving core. Oh, well, okay. LSU's wide receiving core. I think quarterback, you could go there too because Garrett Nussmeyer is great and so is Jaden Daniels. But, man – those wide receivers, I just don't know. Now adding Aaron Anderson to that group, who Brian Kelly just announced is going to – oh, by the way, he's going to be our kick returner and our punt returner. That tells you what kind of athlete he is. And they've got him at slot receiver, added to Kyron Lacey, Malik Neighbors, Brian Thomas, you know, Chris Hilton, all those guys. I mean, come on. Yeah, and I mean, you got Mason Taylor, too, at tight end, uh, yeah. a guy that I think is going to have a special year. And, and I know they lost some guys. Obviously, Butte didn't really work out his last year there at LSU. kind of came and went, and then it just went. Uh, best transferred. But look, when it comes to athletes, especially on the outside, LSU is the last place I'm worried about. But, yeah, I would say them in, in the quarterback room as well. 
Yeah, that, so so some honorable mentions there. Um, now I want to talk about maybe the most underrated position group, maybe a group that isn't getting all the notoriety, but you think, hey, that's a collection of some solid dudes there in that room. You know, and and I, I got to give a shout out to Hugh Freeze here. I'm going to stay on the offensive line. I think Auburn's uh, really upgraded on the offensive line. I think you're going to see it this year, uh, you know, really given the ability in that RPO style system to be dangerous running the ball. It's going to help Peyton Thorne out a lot. Uh, you look at them, you know, bringing the gunner kid over from Western Kentucky, bringing Avery Jones over a uh, guy that's very, very reliable. You bring the two kids from Tulsa, Dylan Wade and Muskrat. You get too tall from the, from, you know, the Juco ranks and that's a place. And it's weird. It's been weird to see Auburn struggle with offensive linemen. I mean, that that's a place that, you look at some of the offensive line that Auburn's put out, and that's what they're really known for. You know, offensive line and defensive line, that's really how they kind of rose up. So I think Hugh Freeze, that's one of the reasons I've got Auburn going 8-4 and four this year is because the offensive line, I think, is upgraded that much. They've added some help at the skill positions, obviously. It's going to be interesting to see how Peyton Thorne does, how good his legs are in that style system, if he can be a legitimate threat to be able to run the ball, keep the ball, pull the ball in that RPO system and, and hold guys there. But I really expect Auburn to take a big step forward on the offensive line. In terms of that, just talk a little bit about how big of a get it was for Hugh Freeze to bring in Philip Montgomery as his offensive coordinator because at times you would watch that Tulsa team. They went on the road to Ole Miss, I think it was either last year or the year before, and gave Ole Miss all they could absolutely handle. They were a throwing the ball type team all over the yard with their quarterback. Quarterback goes down, they bring in a, a running quarterback, and they absolutely ran it down Ole Miss's throat with that kind of mentality. Two of those guys are coming over to play offensive line, like you said, for Auburn. Just talk about the dynamic of Philip Montgomery, Hugh Freeze, because everybody knows Hugh Freeze is an offensive coach, but what kind of an impact is former uh, Tulsa head coach Philip Montgomery going to have on that on that staff? Well, it's huge, and, and I think you can throw Ron Roberts from Baylor, the new defensive coordinator, coordinator in this group, too. They, they've seen a lot of ball. There's nothing they don't know how to adjust to. There's no look that they haven't seen. They're not going to be surprised by anything, and they know how to adjust. Right, We don't give coaches enough. We talk about coaches game planning, and that's huge, obviously. Being able to game plan. Put your guys in the right spot. Understand how to get your personnel in a situation where the matchup benefits you because it's a game of matchups. But football's like life. It is a game of adjustments. And it's not just your first adjustment. It's the adjustment to how they adjust to you. That's why the best coaches are the ones that are able to go in there in halftime and figure out a way to maybe attack something that's vulnerable. Or if you're getting a look you maybe didn't expect if they're throwing something new at you, being able to not only know the adjustment you have to make, but communicate that to your players. So I think when you mix two offensive minds like Hugh Freeze and Phil Montgomery, there's not a question that you can't answer, and you can communicate and vocalize it in a way to the players that they can understand. Because there's a saying in coaching, it don't make a difference how much I know. It's how much I know that I can get you to know. Because Coach Montgomery ain't going to take a snap, throw a ball, run the ball, catch a ball. Neither is Hugh Freeze. And I think Hugh Freeze, talking about Phil Montgomery, is going to call the plays. But okay, play that's calling what I was is about to ask you next. Yeah, yeah. It's, he talked about in SEC media days. He's going to call the plays, even though sometimes I think fans really don't understand how play calling works. You have one guy's voice, whether it's the offensive coordinator or whether it's you know a Lincoln Riley situation or a Steve Sarkeesian situation where the head coach is calling the plays, who ends up calling the plays. But there's a flow of information. If you've ever been on a headset, you have your coaches, your offensive coaches, on when they're on offense are always looking at something. And some coaches have defensive guys, especially the younger guys, looking at things as well because you can't see everything just by one guy. Why do you think most offensive coordinators are up in the box? Because you can see the most up there, but you can't see everything up there. So the flow of information is is crucial. And as an offensive coordinator, a lot of times, and I've heard that I was a special teams guy most of my career as well as being a defensive guy. So my headset could hear both offense and defense. So because they had to be able to do it for special teams, right? You have punt and and then punt return, which is offensive and defensive. Uh, you got to be able to talk to both. So I would I would hear the communication between the head coach and the coordinators. And a lot of times that the offensive coordinator is the one who's calling the plays. He's asking, hey, coach, what do you like here? You know, what what, what are you seeing? What are you feeling? Hey, it's third and two. What do you want to do? Hey, let's run it. Let's get in 12 personnel and run it. What play do you like? And then he'll tell you the play that he likes. So it's a flow of information. Hey, tight ends coach, what are you seeing up there? You know, what's the nickel doing? What's the will doing? Are they overplaying it? A lot of times, like when Lane Kiffin throws the clipboard up, 
right after the snap. People say, how does he know that? Well, I'm going to tell you how he knows it because he probably asked the wide receivers coach who's up in the booth what that safety is doing on play action, and they caught him with his pants down in front of the whole high school at the musical and hit him two plays later, called a play to set up another play. So I, I think that's huge as well, something to kind of get into the headset. A lot of people probably don't know. It's not just the offensive coordinator saying, hey, here we go, we're going to run this, and everybody just shuts the hell up. And sometimes, you know, when it's on tight downs or there's a big decision to be made, you will ask the head coach, hey, what do you like? Sometimes the head coach says, you call it. Whatever you like and whatever you feel and you call it, let's take a shot deep. Let's do something like that. But Phil Montgomery, too, he comes from that Art Briles school of spacing yeah. and alignment difference. What do I mean by that? A lot of guys, What when you say doubles, when you go out and line up in doubles and the ball's in the right hash or the ball's in the right middle, the ball's in the middle of the field, which is rare, the ball's in the left middle, ball's on left hash, there's a certain way they line up, right? You're on top of the numbers. You're on the hash or you're two yards outside the hash. Well, defenses typically line up against offenses that line up normal. That's not what Art Bryles and them did at Baylor. That's not what Phil Montgomery does. He messes with your spacing. Right, it's almost like the triple option of the outsides, what I call it, because the spacing is all messed up. Not so what that, Josh Heupel does. <laughs> that's exactly right. So, like, if I'm supposed to typically line up, hey, all right, it's ten personnel, ten personnel. All right, they're lining up in doubles, but okay, well, the, well, the four, it looks different. The spacing's different. So I don't line up on my divider. Uh, if he's three steps wider, I go three steps wider, and all that that creates space. It creates confusion and it creates space. And all these guys need at this level is a little bit of extra space to be able to blow by you. So it's messing with the defense's alignment by your alignment. And you can run different plays and combinations from different areas. It's hard to get a bead on that. And you've seen a lot more of that in college football. You mentioned Josh Heupel. Tennessee, look how wide they get, right? They're doing that for a reason. It used to be when you get wide like that is because you're trying to run it in that void. Well, now yeah. that's not what that means 100% anymore. So defense have had to be able to adjust. So you're going to see that. I think that RPO run style that, that Hugh Freeze wants, but you're going to see the Phillip Montgomery splits and the combinations in the passing game. I'm very interested to see how they gel that together because it could be pretty nasty. Think about you talking about spacing and not always, you know, to run into that space. Now it may be you're talking about being on the hash. Let's say you're on the right hash. You may put, you know, trips strong into the into the boundary. You may yeah. you may go tight end trips or bunch trips or something like that and run that patented like Hugh, Hugh Freeze is able to do a power sweep or a power read or something like that, but have an X glance on the backside or X slant and, and yeah. that communication on the headset may be, hey, we're going to run this power sweep, but just tell me, tell me how far that that outside linebacker is willing to go out there to cheat it, you know, so we know if we can come back and hit that underneath that kind of stuff, and they can mess with you and do that. And with Peyton Thorne, I think they'll really be able to to do it because I think he can run well enough to be able to to take advantage of stuff. But I think he'll be more accurate than Robbie. Yeah, Astrid, and and, and he'll make good decisions. He's he's a coach's son. You, you talk about you're talking about formation in the boundary FIB, which. As a former defensive coach, God, the, the evil that comes out of formation in the boundary, just having to deal with that. Uh, it's an absolute nightmare. If, if you're Lane Kiffin does a really good job of it. That's one of the best things he does is formation in the boundary. You're overloading the weak side. And a lot of times, like you're talking about, if you're going to go, if you're on the right hash and you're going formation in the boundary and you split that other receiver out on top of the numbers, that's tough to get safety help. If that's a matchup that you like, you talk about being on an island. I mean, that dude's up in the Arctic Circle by himself out there. And if you want to cheat a safety, you're going to have to cheat him way over there, which makes you lighten the pants in the box. And that yep. safety's late coming down. I mean, th there's a lot of ways. Those offensive guys, man, it's, it's you know, w Willy Wonka's chocolate factory sometimes with these guys. And I hate having to get ready for it. Thank goodness I can just talk about it now. Absolutely. And I, as I did with the other one, I got to throw out an honorable mention. I'm going to go with Texas A&M's wide receiver group because, yeah, like my that. goodness, I got to looking at it. Anaya Smith, we know what he is. And then you have Evan Stewart, who may be, truthfully, he may be the best number one receiver in the in the league before it's said and done. He's, yeah, he's dynamic. Nice. Like, oh, it's all get out. You have uh, Moose Muhammad. We know the NFL – pedigree there and then noah thomas is a guy nobody talks about he's six four 200 pounds that is just out there running wide open for connor wigman to throw the football they got good tight ends as well so that that group is a little bit underrated i think jake i agree and, and the more they play the more they're going to grow up and the more they grow up the more experience they get the more dangerous they're going to be and they're going to be able to grow with connor that's that's why i keep telling and a &M fans you know i i, I have a&m going eight and four this year i got him beating bam at home 
And I keep saying, I've said this for the last two years, 2024 is the year. 2024 is the year. You're going to be old up front and experienced. You're going to be older at quarterback, talented and experienced. You're going to be older at wide receiver, talented and experienced. And they get to grow together. It's one thing to, to kind of mix and match guys from the portal that have played different places. It's another thing to grow in the same place and grow in the same system, right? It, that's that's a totally different thing. And that chemistry, you know, especially on game day when the bullets really start flying, that's how you turn into a dominant team. Absolutely. Now it is time to talk about this game for North Carolina and South Carolina. It is a great opener in Charlotte. The South Carolina Gamecocks have a lot of excitement. Uh, although I do like to point out to people, it was still a roller coaster there at the end. You lose 38 to 6 to Florida, and then you come and beat the brakes off of Tennessee, beat Clemson, then lose to Notre Dame. So it was still roller coaster, even when it was at its peak. But there is a ton of expectations on this South Carolina team. I feel like people are dying to see them get up in that 9-10 win area if, if that's what the fans want. They want that next thing. And, and to live up to those expectations, I just got to wonder, is this a must win for South Carolina to open the season? Well, if they're going to get to 9 or possibly 10, yes. But but I tell you, and, and look, I, I've said this multiple times, and, and we've interviewed Shane Beamer. I love Shane Beamer. I think he's the perfect guy for the job there. Their time's coming. It's just not this year. And, and I know they got hot at the end of last year. But you lose Jaheim Bell. You lose Marshawn Lloyd. You lose your left tackle during spring. South Carolina is not a good team up front on either side of the ball. They're just not. And I'm not going to sit here and pretend just because I, I love Shane Beamer and I think Spencer Rattler is an NFL quarterback and it's been so great to watch his maturity off the field. We've always known he's talented on the field. But I think his maturity off the field has really helped him develop on the field into what he's going to be and then taking it to the next level. I think he looks a lot better in scout size uh, than he did as a young guy. But when I look at South Carolina, and I think this game, it's going to be tight. I like North Carolina in it. I think they're going to kick a field goal to win it. I think 34-31 North Carolina, somewhere around there. But when I look at this front seven on defense for South Carolina, you're going to be bottom of the barrel in the SEC. Right now, there may some time. There's going to be ups and downs. Then that offensive line. It's a group of five offensive line. Let, let's let's really yeah. look at it. And I know I mentioned Auburn earlier that had some of the group of five guys come over. I think it's a little bit of a different flavor of ice cream. And South Carolina lost their left tackle during spring. So Huge football loss. is the ultimate team sport. This is not basketball. It's not baseball. It's not golf. One guy can't go out there and play well while everybody else plays bad and win the whole thing. The quarterback is only as good as the sum of the parts around him. If they cannot protect Spencer Rattler, he will not be able to maximize his efficiency and proficiency. If they can't run the ball, they're not going to be able to achieve balance on offense. They're going to get in third and long a bunch. They're going to become very, very predictable, and it's going to become a problem because they're going to be one-dimensional, and that leads to turnovers. And special teams, as incredible as they have been, and it's saved them before, you cannot sit there and rely on that every single game, every single year to block a punt or run a kickback for a touchdown. Uh, and this year, I've got them going five and seven, and I really believe yeah. in that. And and I don't say that I don't I don't have any biases toward teams. I I'm an Auburn fan. I hope Auburn wins every game, but I'm harder on Auburn than anybody. I'm gonna tell you the truth when I watch them play. I mean, I took UMass plus thirty seven and a half as quickly as I could freaking get it after watching them because that's a lot of points. But when I look at the South Carolina team, they're getting there. They're just on the road. They're on the – what's it What's it uh, that 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 sequel they made uh, to Yellowstone, like 18, you know, 86, where they're yeah. just on the, on the trail trying to go out there, yeah. right? Shane Beamer right now – Yeah, Shane Beamer right now is old guy that's in every country movie ever with the mustache leading them out there, and they're just trying to survive, just survive to get there. And when you get there, when you get out there to Oregon – Build that log cabin, dog. Feel safe. Yeah. Nobody's going to mess you. You don't have to be dodging arrows or malaria or dysentery or anything that used to kill me on that Oregon Trail game. Too much meat on the wagon, whatever. But that was rough. on the road, they're just not there yet. That, that was rough. Now, I will, I will say this. I think if South Carolina is to win this game, to your point, I do think the offensive line – is a detriment to this team right now. It's it's just not strong. Uh, they don't have 
solid running back play. I mean, DeCarry Joyner is a guy who's – I love him to death and his guts and determination and what he's done for that program, but he's just not a lead running back in the SEC, and I don't know if Ju- Juju McDowell's the answer either. But if they're going to win this game – where they do have the opportunity to do it, they do have some guys that have been around up front on the defensive side of the ball. And if they can frustrate Drake May, because I don't think North Carolina's offensive line is great either. If they can frustrate Drake May, they do have some playmakers on the back end there in Nick Emanwari, uh, DQ Smith, uh, Marcellus Dial, those kind of guys in the secondary. So if they could maybe get some pressure on Drake May and, and lock down uh, those North Carolina receivers who they – they may not have they may or may not have Tez Walker, and that's a whole nother story with the NCAA and that that garbacle over there. But uh it's is that the secret to to winning this game, you think? And of course Spencer Rattler will have to play well because they don't have a running game in South Carolina. But it is that defense just having to step up and go lights out against a really good North Carolina quarterback. Yeah. Well, look, I I, I th- Let's not act like North Carolina's defense is exactly the steel curtain either. I mean, they were they are. one of the worst defense. I think they were top five worst tackling defenses in the country last year, and they had some talent on the defensive line. I think they only ended up with 17 sacks on the whole season, which is an absolute joke. We, I mean, you got Gene Chizik back there talking about a guy that, that's known a lot of ball. I don't know if they're going to change anything schematically, but they need, to, they need to do something to be able to create more havoc on the defensive side. Now, when it comes to stopping Drake May, and, and this is going to sound a little bit different. It's it's almost it's damn near impossible to stop Drake May. Yeah. Okay, but if I'm going against Drake May, right? And and we talk about Tez and and what they're doing to him from the NCAA, which is nothing but a racketeering front. Should hit him with a RICO charge, in my opinion. That's story for another day. You have to make Drake May beat you with his arm. You do. Mm-hmm. You've got to keep it. Not that he and he can. He can torch you with his arm. He had the highest EPA uh, of of any quarterback in the country, I believe, last year. So he can beat you with his arm. But where Drake May destroys you, where he is able to keep drives alive, is when you let him break the pocket or slip a guy and extend the play and turn it into the scramble drill. Drake May is the best at improvising I've seen since Ryan Stiles on whose line is it anyway. He's incredible. He keeps his eyes downfield. He's got really good feel. He can throw the fastball. He can throw the changeup. Hell, he can throw the slider if he has to. He can change arm arm angles, platforms, however you want to call it, contort his body like he works for Circus Olay out there and make throws and run. Like Drake May can yeah. run. He can legitimately – he's a long strider. He's a, almost a Justin Herbert clone, but I think he's more athletic. I think he's more athletic than Justin wow. is running the ball. That's saying something. No, no, it is because and Justin's more of a long strider, right? Justin's yeah. more one of those guys. Once he gets going, he gets going. Drake's good in bursts too. So if I'm South Carolina, you're gonna have to play a game of beat me from the pocket, and we all know you can. But I would much rather go down that way or give up a lot of points that way than letting you just run silly nilly and us lose contain and do things like that. And and don't forget, North Carolina's got a couple good backs too. Like North Carolina, I know the offensive line isn't great. I think they're going to be a little bit better than what people think. They got a couple good backs. I know they lost the Downs kid and the, the situation with Tez is going on a receiver, but I wouldn't be surprised if you saw a couple guys step up and Drake May, great players tend to make other players elevate around them. And I think that's what you'll see with Drake May. But also don't forget Chip Lindsey, new offensive coordinator at North Carolina. Phil Longo has gone up to Wisconsin. One of the many reasons I have Wisconsin going 11-1 and this year and losing to Michigan in the Big Ten championship game. Watch out for the Badgers. They're jumping around up there, and they should be. But that's how you got to stop Drake May, or at least attempt to. I don't know that there's a game that has two offensive coordinators, new offensive coordinators, that maybe the teams that got those guys are like, Oh, uh, I don't know what we got here. I mean, yeah, with Loggins in South Carolina, Loggins. I mean, we know how it went in the NFL. Didn't exactly go great. You know, Chip Lindsey's had some success in college. But but a lot of it, too, is, you know, the players make the plays, right? If you got the Jims and the Joes, the X's and O's seem to take care of themselves a, a, a little bit more. There's, that's why there's not just one system in college football that everybody runs to be able to win a championship. There's identities are an identity that you need to have to be able to win a championship. And that identity is physicality, and you build everything off of that. But I think Drake May could line up in the triple option or the veer and still be a really good quarterback. But again, game planning, putting guys in those situations, being able to tell them how to adjust, uh, where they need to adjust, and who they need to adjust to, those are all big things. 
Yep, it, we'll see if Spencer Rattler lives up to to all the hype that he's getting this preseason, and see if they can, uh, you know, get a little bit of that running game going to try to help things out. Jake, tell everybody where they can catch, and it's going across the bottom of the screen if you're watching, but tell everybody where they can catch you, your brother Blaine, and David Cohn on Crane and Company every morning. Yeah, well, if you like what you're hearing, and and if you're not, I'm sorry about you being deaf. Uh, go to uh, Crane and Company on YouTube. It's C R A I N and Company. Uh, we're almost to 100,000 subscribers. I think we're less than a thousand subs away now. Uh, college football season's here. We're doing a ton of breakdowns. David Cohn, former quarterback at Michigan, broke down one of Notre Dame's plays, uh, and then I got I broke down the defensive side of it, which was great because it was an absolute disaster by Navy. Kind of feels like you're in the meeting room a little bit, but we're breaking down everything, dropping bets. Uh, we were in the green last week. Good start. Hopefully uh, keep that train rolling this week as we kind of feel these teams out, get to know who they are, which is a fun process. It's back. Go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, on Twitter. You can see the bottom of your screen, but head over there to Crane & Company on YouTube or the Daily Wire. Uh, we're on Daily Wire Plus for the sports show over there. And check us out, man, live each weekday morning, 6.30 a.m. to 8 a.m. Central, 7.30 a.m. to 9 a.m. Eastern. Those are the only time zones I know, man. That's the only time zone. If you're listening on podcasts, you can follow Jake at Jake Crane underscore, or you can follow Crane and Company using at Crane Company on Twitter or on X, as we should call it now. Yeah, whatever sure it's called I'm, this week. I'm sure Flamingo, it'll be Crane Company knows? on X before too long. I'll take the, the Tucker on X route before too long. It'll, it'll, yeah, it'll yeah, w- without a doubt. Well, if you listen to some of our arguments, you may think it's Crane and Company on X anyway, so who knows? It's a different kind of X. Well, guys, that <laughs> is Jake Crane. I am Blaine Gilmer. We love having you join us each week here for Jake's Takes on Southeastern 14. And we will catch you next week with episode four, where we'll have a full slate of games to break down and then another full state uh, state of games to preview. So this is a great time of year to hop on this train. Like I said, that's Jake Crane. I'm Blaine Gilmer. We'll catch you next time right here on Southeastern 14. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.